Resident Evil 4 Remake's Ada Simp DLC is officially here, and to celebrate this historic day of nostalgia-infused masochism, it was time for me to get out there and push the boundaries of human suffering to levels that were unacceptable to the casual gamer. Oh. Can you be separate ways on professional without ever taking damage? This challenge, which would raise our cortisol to lethal levels, required us to complete a fresh new playthrough of the game without so much as a toe stub of damage. To exacerbate this parameter, we'd also be selecting the hardest difficulty the game had to offer, professional. Which turned even the most basic of enemies into feral fart sniffers who subsisted off the unhappiness I felt when having to restart my checkpoint. They were faster, took more damage to stop, and parrying with your knife was now reserved exclusively for individuals with Adderall infused reaction times. This, however, wasn't even the worst part. On any other difficulty, as per your constitutional rights, you were entitled to the ability of auto saving, allowing you to quickly load your most recent checkpoint should you so wish. However, Pueblo had no court of human rights, so you as the player, or victim, had no entitlement to autosaves. Hi, I'm Saul Goodman. Did you know that you have rights? The Constitution says you do. This meant that the scarce typewriters dotted around the map had now become the most valuable commodity in the game, providing you with the only opportunity to save our precious progress. Look at that subtle off-white coloring. The tasteful thickness of it. Oh my god. It even has a watermark. And just to add some extra spice, we'd be banning any usage of the rocket launcher or any other New Game Plus weapons to display the pain of a no damage run in its purest form. Resets would be plentiful, stress and pain would be at an all time high, and my overall enjoyment of this game was no longer a guarantee. So hold your life size data body pillows tightly and strap yourselves in, gamers. It's going to be a bumpy ride. So the game opens up with Luis taking part in week one of Dancing with the Stars and Ada coming in to rescue him, donning the Nintendo Wii exclusive bedsheet DLC costume. Our focus was now on retrieving something for Wesker called the Amber, a mysterious object that contained preserved dinosaur DNA that Wesker planned to use to open his own Jurassic Park and provide John Hammond with the perfect designer piece to riz up his walking stick. Before we had time to retrieve the Amber, the predator that had hunted Arnold Schwarzenegger in the first film of the same name had arrived, codenamed Tomato Pisanta, and she had arrived to send us immediately back to the main menu. I wish this was meant to be like a funny line or something, but she instantaneously did. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. After that initial attack, Basanta had infected us with tapeworms which were now coursing through our veins and causing us to hallucinate. This was now a predator gangbang and we were the main course. Despite them supposedly being figments of our imagination, these fever dreams still packed a punch and were ready to issue out turbo resets on Basanta's behalf. Without too much trouble, we sent Basanta to the Shadow Realm and head out to take care of the rest of the castle entourage. Stealth would continue to be our best friend here and throughout the challenge, leveraging maximum damage with little to no risk to our fragile Christian bodies. Oh God. After clearing out the foot soldiers and the cannons, we swing over like Spider Gwen and repeat the process for the second area before closing out the opening chapter. Do you honestly think you're fucking funny? Seriously. We swing through the quarry, enjoying the Resident Evil universe's equivalent to Assassin's Creed, before a group of aggressive Jehovah's Witnesses break through the door after our repeated attempts at pretending nobody was home. Our mission to the church rendezvous continued as we refused to pay the local Pueblo Airbnb owners their mandatory 40,000 pesetas cleaning fee before moving delicately through the animals to avoid any embarrassing resets. You may laugh, but these little goblins had the taste for human flesh and could tell you limb from limb in a heartbeat. But lucky for me, I'd taken part in Veganuary one time in 2018 and had gained the trust and respect of the local wildlife and could pass unmolested. Up on the Wimmer, we watch ominously on as Leon applied his training in the Raccoon City Police Department by shooting first and asking questions later. Get out of my face! We swing peacefully through the mountainside before falsifying a parliamentary call to bingo, but whilst we were doing that, we could hear something coming from inside the church. Now, caution is your best friend on a no damage run. If your gut is telling you to avoid something, it's usually the right call. So when this entire mob of boomer bingo enjoyers congregated outside of the church waiting to be let in, I wrestled internally with what my instincts were telling me. Common sense dictated that I should just move on and continue the run risk-free, but common sense lost that day. And we pick up a pair of limited edition Stephen Hawking glasses for our faith in the process. 
we meet up with the chief commercial officer of Pueblo, the Giga Chad, known to his close friends and family as the Merchant, where we picked up the sword off at a discount price, a weapon that had the power to maintain the social distancing required for this challenge. Not to mention as well that this tune is a certified banger. But the serotonin being deployed to our brain in this moment had an expiry date of now. With Ada now slipping into a parasite-induced psychosis and turning a beautiful shade of jaundice, Pisanta, the chief architect of this delusion, had arrived to upload more malware directly to our brains. During this two-for-one cyberbullying special, we had three phases to deal with, each one unlocking more and more chronic pain as we went. For the first phase, you could loop Pisanta around the burnt corpse of the local community support officer, but the second and third phases were serious threats to my long-term health. Why are we still here? Despite being the equivalent of a one-star food safety rating, the safest strat that I could find was to use the entire outer part of the village as a circuit, using the fence outside the main house as an excellent way to filter our pursuers and gain some distance, especially as their teleporting movesets were complete and utter bull****. As simple as that sounded, 25 resets later and the bottle of bleach in my toilet was looking like it might quench my thirst. Luckily on this channel, pain and self-loathing were characteristics that I had fully maxed out on spawning in. And we use our HG and flash grenade combo to Thanos snap the two mimics away and focus our damage on the real Pesanta. And despite almost blowing my chance by spamming F to pick up this ammo and accidentally breaking the other crate at the worst possible time, we send Pesanta crying back to Papa Salazar with his tail between his legs. We arrive at Chateau de Mendez to conduct a no-knock warrant issued by Wesker on the downstairs toilet, but you cannot imagine my disappointment when I burst in ready to greet my old friend with a full 12 gauge to the face, only to find him missing, replaced instead with a steaming pile of poo that we would have to assume was his. The DLC may be good, but it's clearly not that good. And to make matters worse, with his home basically becoming a walk-in car boot sale, Mendez was understandably quite frustrated, chasing us out and forcing us to flee on foot to avoid being brought to justice. We find the agony crossbow in the factory which came with diarrhea-tipped arrows which would help us to provide maximum pain to some of our tougher enemies. After using Neuralink technology provided to us by Elon Musk, we were able to track down a pack of cigarettes with a mysterious phone number on. Who could it possibly be for? It was beautiful. It was just a perfect conversation. I think you should ask for VP Pence's conversation because he had a couple of conversations also. I could save you a lot of time, they were all perfect. Before we could finish, my call had been traced and my web history leaked and the village Gestapo, led by two chainsaw demons, were converging on my position to bring me back to party HQ. Now, some may grow scared by the prospect of fighting these two without taking damage, but not me. I figured out that the chainsaw people hadn't actually mastered the concept of a window. Using this supremely advanced tactic, we could cycle in and out of these two windows, crippling Salvador and his wife, or sister, or his cousin, as they stepped over the windowsill in a desperate, futile attempt to catch me. Some may call me a coward, but I didn't care. After taking a nap in the dirt, we wake up inside Mendez's bed and catch Wesker refilling his Rehypno syringe. A highly suspicious set of circumstances indeed. With Wesker marking our mission performance so far as a D, for dipshit, we would now need to get a result or risk being made redundant. We complete more human sterilization in the village and windmill area. Before the poster child of steroid and opioid abuse arrives to kick off this week's AA meeting. Whilst I spent the first few attempts reaching my recommended daily dosage of fisting. I'm dying. Help me. Clearing out the battlefield of other enemy combatants helped to avoid any accidental pitchforking before flying up to the rooftops to issue out copious amounts of d From here, it was all about perseverance and skill. One quality I had, and one I did not. And despite El Gigante flattening my farm area to make way for more sprawling new builds in Pueblo, we successfully defeat him and meet up with Luis to relocate the Amber. Back at the castle, we make it very clear to Luis that we were one more failed piece of amber away from being sacked, so he would now be expected to deliver. But to add a pickle to this ever-growing sh** sandwich, Luis notices that we were exhibiting early symptoms of a severe case of ligma. Luis had a drug that would suppress its effects, but with the cult torching Luis's office, destroying both the suppressant and his extensive hentai collection, we would need to help collect ingredients around the castle to synthesize a new batch. Despite knowing that we couldn't afford to be distracted by cheap sex potions at such a crucial stage of the mission, Luis insisted this was the only way to make it out of here alive. Luis writes us down a quick shopping list that we would need to collect for him to make the suppressant, and with a hearty wave, we reluctantly head off to go get them. 
The castle was a mausoleum of misery, immediately giving us a first class ticket back to the start of the chapter before we could even reach the first typewriter, which was literally two feet away from us. With torment and anguish now lurking around every corner, we'd need to be careful. The first of three ingredients required for Ligma soup was the masculinity of Leon, which we collected in this beautiful diffuser bottle. We then escaped the drill of justice and arrived in the knight's domain to retrieve the next ingredient, a bottle of champagne. After taking the bottle, we were assigned a five-star wanted level, with night security being deployed to violate our mental health and forcibly send us back to the nearest typewriter. In total, we had to fend off six nights in a space equivalent to a one-bed flat in London, but more annoyingly, we had additional crossbow dingleberries arriving in the AO. Now, you've got two options here. You can either leave the silver bottle in its spot to allow the crossbowers to enter the main arena, or you could take it with you to force them to stay in their tiny little rooms. Now, both options were undesirable as these coked up Scientologists were like bow and arrow terminators, but I personally chose to leave it open to allow a better connection with my drive-by shotgun rounds. After a little bit of trial and error, I decided that the play area was unsuitable. And as they say, if you didn't like the way the table was set, you simply grenade it. So we open up multiple routes either side of the knights to help maneuverability and with the perfect mixture of athleticism, pinpoint accuracy and absolute blind luck, we finally lay the group to rest. On our way back to Luis, the hunchback of Notre Salazar locks us in the maze against our will and plays hide and go seek with the key. <laughs> now there was a no tolerance policy for red bathrobes in this maze so we swing over the nearest hedge like a violent Batman and personally escort him to the gates of St. Peter. With the final ingredient now retrieved from the National Museum of Insects, Luis reveals that the suppressant is just homemade meth, which he brews for us in his little wooden box. Let him cook! With the parasite now experiencing a high like no other, we head down to the sewer area, which had been unofficially claimed by the Navistadors. After forcibly evicting a few of them from their home, the merchant supplied a few new wares, including the Stingray and a Shield Destroyer charm, which was pretty huge. After draining all of the drinking water out of the entire village and irreversibly destroying the local ecosystem, we clear out the rest of the Navistadors before being served the next item on the menu of mental distress. The Garador. A creature whose blindness had been weaponized in ways that would arouse the military superpowers around the world. On my first playthrough on Hardcore, there was only one Garador here, so you can imagine my surprise when I turned the corner and found that the visual impairment in this room had been doubled. Despite the odds stacked against us and some moments that would have sucked your testicles inside of you, we dissolved the first Garador in a matter of seconds with the Stingray and used the other one to delete the remaining opposition in here before giving him mental darkness to match his visual darkness. Up next, however, was a level of psychological distress that I could never have anticipated that a piece of DLC could have supplied. Pisanta had arrived and after dunking an entire stairway on top of her, had now shed her mortal clothing and transformed into U3. Whilst my OG Resident Evil 4 receptors were tingling with joy and dopamine was being delivered directly to my brain, it was bittersweet as the dopamine was now being infused with a massive U3 shaped tumour that this section was going to create. The U3 boss is split into two parts, the first opening brawl followed by a second where you square off against its reanimated hemorrhoid. However, a problem. Ooh. If you recall at the start of the video where we outlined the rules, professional difficulty removes our autosave. So after defeating Euphrey's first form, if we take damage in the second arena, which there was about a 99.9% .9 chance of this happening, we would need to load back from this typewriter and beat Euphrey again. A wholly undesirable prospect. To add further complexity to this whole process, I'm pretty sure that the dodge prompts in separate ways are either bugged, weird, or I'm just washed, because at some points, even when I hit the perfect dodge, I would still take damage. Countless opportunities were lost on u 3s second stage, just when I thought I might have clutched up. I'd be speared, spat on, slapped, assaulted by the Navistadors, or in some cases, despite nailing my skill checks, I'd be completely fisted by the horrifying lack of iframes. Sure, after hours of practice I could now load my saved data at record speeds, a skill normally reserved only for Omega Chads, but this didn't help get me closer to my goal. Days turned into weeks, hours into years. I'd lost all bearing of time and space, and for me, this had become my new norm. After hours of attempts with my frontal lobe now deteriorating at an accelerated rate, I sat down in the darkness of my office and wondered if this was it. Had my existence on this earth as a mediocre challenge YouTuber amounted just to this. Zero, you can do this and never forget, you've got a massive Johnson. <sighs> can you just shut up, please, you stupid bitch? Shut up. You're chatting shit. My hours of practice had honed my abilities. You free was now, dare I say it, easy. She'd become nothing more than a predictable program, reduced to being stun-locked in place with an explosive crossbow and forced to become epileptic against her will. Now was our time. This 
was the run, which unironically was my worst one yet. I accidentally had a brain fart and picked up the barrette before I'd collected all the resources in the area and reloaded all my guns. With everything completely empty, I flailed around the arena like a plastic bag, drifting through the wind, wanting to start again. But despite missing the opening cycle, we pick it up again. Sniper shots and crossbow bolts fly at speed directly into the worm's sensitive areas. The Novies arrive to back their homie up, but my patent pending flash and fly strategy worked perfectly. The flash would knock everyone down to the ground, we damage you free and drop back down to put the Novies out of their misery. We then used the crossbow to knock you free off the roof, and despite all the pain and anguish I'd previously felt, I absolutely smash my skill check and send you free to the big tea bag in the sky. The stress and pressure had clearly got to Ada, who froze up her lunch, and in summary, ears ringing, jaw fractured, three ribs cracked, four broken, diaphragm hemorrhaging, physical recovery, six weeks, full psychological recovery, six months, capacity to restart checkpoint continuously, neutralized. We head into the caverns in desperate search of a typewriter. If I took damage here, I'd be sent back to the start of the U3 fight and immediately rupture the brain aneurysm I've been growing steadily since the start of this challenge. <laughs> Despite watching Krauser gleefully dance down the steps like he was a kid running to infect the family computer for free V-Bucks, I'd never been more tense fighting in the clock tower area. But luckily, once I was inside the cave system, we find the beautiful glow of the merchant's torches and sprint right past him to frantically type our data into our beloved typewriter. Safety. Sanctuary. The future was looking bright. We send the mind dwellers to permanently worship Sadler in the afterlife, lure a few enemies down to the cave system to turn them into pancakes, and arrive just in time to give Leon a guided tour of the island. We post up on the grassy knoll and get ready to JFK Sadler before Wesker arrives to intervene, stating that a change of plan had meant that our mental suffering needed to be prolonged for a further two chapters. The start to our mental discomfort begins at the bulldozer section, consisting of a platoon of soldiers and two broods. We train the goons behind us and methodically whittle them down before creeping on Leon and Ashley in the vents above. I can smell you. It was about 2am by the time I reached the lab and the mixture of regenerators complete darkness and an Iron Maiden provided the perfect breeding ground for me to fill my pants with the brown stuff. Particularly this moment with the Iron Maiden sprinting at me from the darkness, regressing my progress by about 20 minutes. Sidetracks and heart attacks aside, we eventually get the Iron Maiden to combust and catch the gondola down to Pueblo's reenactment of the Normandy beaches. These manned, but not manned, Terminator auto turrets could erode our health by the tiniest fractions, even when in mid-air. After escaping the turrets, we now faced a literal army stationed at the comms building. We had to fight through an opening welcome party, a follow-up group of around eight soldiers, another party of ten soldiers when turning the first turret off, the Arrow Brute and his bodyguards, and a further platoon once we crossed the bridge and switched the main turret off. At times, we were force-fed dynamite, committed self-induced explosive resets, <laughs> That's quite big. And one time, just as we were about to leave the area, we got trapped and decapitated mere moments before completing this section. But hey, what was a little bit more pain in amidst this sea of anguish? This is fine. We were in the endgame now, and one repeat later, total victory was in sight. Arriving at the comms tower, the workers had seen better days and had apparently had their life support switched off by a creature named Martinico. Hello there. Martin had been the organization's first attempt at recreating dinosaurs using the fossilized amber, but the end product had been more zombie Wreck-It Ralph than T-Rex. <coughs> Despite him now stalking us through the halls of the comms facility, we plug Wesker directly into the island's mainframe so he can upload ransomware to the villagers' computers. On our way back out, we were subjected to laser grid PTSD. For those of us who'd seen the original Resident Evil film, We'd seen this place before, but we pull out some of the slickest moves on the market to help convert Martin into spaghetti bolognese. On our return to the island, it was now time to face up to the man in charge, the Pope Francis of this religious institution. Now, I'd left my resources completely untouched to give me maximum flexibility for the Sadler fight. This way, I could use a multitude of different tactics to help find the optimal strategy. Now, despite the usual bullshit of our dodges not working and Sadler's attacks being horsely disguised as a succulent Chinese meal, the strat I settled on was to use the bow gun again and lure him around these opening two pillars. If your pathing was perfect, Sadler would simply walk around them and give you maximum time and coverage to dodge the attacks he did make. After our bow bolts were depleted, we used a mix of the TMP and the rifle to induce a specific attack from Sadler, the hand machine gun. During this or the oil fountain attack, if you position yourself like this, you can throw a flurry of heavy grenades at his feet to induce even more damage. That's a lot of damage. From there, consistent damage and movement gets us within a pubic hair of victory. 
Controversially, this had been the fight I was most worried about, but ended up being one of the easiest. Go figure. But before we can escape, we're assaulted and taken hostage by Sadler's bulging thing. We catch up with Leon who dropships us into the metal floor at 100 miles an hour and we begin our final push to the red rocket launcher. This launcher was tipped with weaponized gonorrhea, which Leon could use to defeat Sandler once and for all. The fight through the construction site was fairly straightforward. The only tense moments were us being forced to fight the double brutes again and when I awkwardly tried to rush the lift, only to be told that the computer said no and that I just had to wait here for my imminent death to arrive. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. But this was it. The mission was complete. The challenge was complete. And it was time for us to officially go in different directions. So, can you beat separate ways on professional with no rocket launcher without ever taking damage? You most certainly can, but ask yourself this. Why would you want to? On a difficulty scale of easy peasy lemon squeezy to difficult difficult lemon difficult, I'd rate this challenge a North Korea. But regardless, I do hope you gamers enjoyed this little trip down memory lane. Separate Ways is some S-tier DLC for the price and it's probably more complete than most AAA games uh, these days. But next up, we'll be finishing our new Resident Evil game before we return either to Separate Ways or another Resident Evil 4 remake main game challenge. So as always, thanks for watching, you absolute mad lads, and I'll see you next time.